गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून सर गुड आफ्टरनून सर गुड आफ्टरनून okay so today i don't know many of you were absent anyway i will present uh, that uh, second uh, laboratory experiment from my part that we discuss and then after that we continue electrochemistry because this Friday is already uh, <clears throat> so we just few things to we'll discuss from that point. write down the experiment and the title of the experiment is estimation of hardness in water sample by edta method estimation of hardness in water sample uh, by edta method now the question is do you have any idea about the hardness what do you mean by hardness of water what are the different types of hardness that you have know and uh, how they could be eliminated do you have any basic idea so salts of magnesium and calcium uh, they bring hardness to water yes but Any soluble salts, right? That give you the permanent hardness, or sometimes there are certain salts which, if you heat or boil, that uh, some precipitate may uh, they may be eliminated in the form of some precipitate, and those we call temporary hardness of water. Okay. Now, next question is how we can express the hardness of water sample. How we can express? Say ppm unit. Parts per million unit. Yes, that uh, that is correct. But suppose if you sample the water, only magnesium is present, no calcium is present. right no calcium no calcium salt is present but how we can you can express the hardness of water sample do you have any idea actually uh, whatever salt is present magnesium or calcium so equivalent amount of what is the equivalent amount of calcium carbonate that is present in the water sample 50 and that that is used right so first what about salt means in the form of magnesium say chloride or whatever is there or calcium salt it may or may not be present suppose all the magnesium is present so what is the gram equivalent of that magnesium salt 
and what is the amount of that magnesium salt is equivalent to a uh, gram equivalent of calcium carbonate because uh, harness is expressed in terms of what is the amount of calcium carbonate present in parts per million right so one has one has to convert or find out the equivalent amount of calcium carbonate whatever the salt present whether it is uh, magnesium chloride and calcium chloride salts are present then you have to express the equivalent amount of calcium carbonate what is the equivalent amount what is the equivalent how to calculate equivalent weight of the salt you have, i think you have some idea so you can easily calculate okay so let us discuss on the procedure that is how to estimate the uh, water sample uh, the hardness now what is edta you write down this structure carefully edta full form is ethylene diamine tetra acetic acid and this is the structure of na2 h2 edta that is two hydrogen atoms of edta has been replaced by two sodium ions and this is the structure now the pink arrow uh, corresponds to what Do you have any idea? Sir, Louis base. Yes. Actually, this is the. Uh, point this they can coordinate the metal ions. That you know, have you heard the term ligand? So these are the coordinating point, right? The ligand lone pair is there. Now C two C O two H there C double bond O oxygen is there, and C O two minus again oxygen has the lone pair. So that means one such uh, unit. In a two for formula weight, that is a uh, in a two H two entity. One such molecule or entity can bind simultaneously with six uh, metal ions. Right? Or a metal ion can be say calcium, or depending on the nature of the metal ion, so it can satisfy the either the all the Coordination sites are partly right, and you can see it is a hexadentate ligand. Means there are six coordination sites, and these sorts of molecules they have they are called chelating ligand. They have the advantage that once they bind with a metal ion, then this binding strength is very large. Is very significant is very high, is very high. Why? Because once uh, one or two have to be careful. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, sometimes I think it's just somebody else. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. So chelate ligand. Uh, this is chelate ligand uh, because if one or two bonds with metal is ruptured by any means, then the other coordination site will simultaneously hold this metal ion. So that's why uh, these chelating ligands they have specific property that is uh, they can tightly bind with the metal ions. Okay. So this particular ligand, the DZTA, can bind with these metal ions. So maybe magnesium ion, calcium, fluor, iron, okay. And this is the reaction. Say a metal ion uh, can combine with Na2H2DTA, disodium salt of 
ethylene tetracycline and and forms this uh, species that is MPTA minus two charge the deliverization of two protons. So please write down the reaction. Wherein plus two denotes the bivalent metal ions, magnesium, calcium, or iron. So hard water, if iron salt is present, then also it partly provides the hardness of water. So presence of soluble salts of magnesium, calcium, and iron, right, will give you the permanent hardness of water. And we have to estimate this hardness of a sample of water. Okay. How to estimate it? So using this EDTA method, so you know EDTA structure. And uh, now we discuss the proceeding. The first step of this uh, estimation involves standardization of EDTA solution. Supplied. Suppose GDTA solution will be supplied to you in the laboratory. And you have to standardize it. Standardize means you do not know the exact or the correct strength of GDTA solution. And that you have to determine by using its standard solution. There is magnesium sulfate solution. What is the procedure? This is a conical flux that I have shown it here. There you have to take 25 ml standard magnesium sulfate solution. You take 25 ml standard magnesium sulfate solution. So magnesium sulfate is a crystalline solid which has seven molecules of crystalline water. So that's why the salt is sometimes written like this. In the FO4, seven molecules of water. Okay. You take 25 ml standard magnesium sulfate solution. Again, this solution will be supplied in the laboratory. Right. And uh, volume of the conical flux is 250 ml. So at first you take 250 ml conical flux. And you know a conical flux, the shape is somewhat like this. And at the bottom neck, there is a, a tip of the neck, there is a marking that is uh, labeled as 27 degree centigrade. That means 250 ml volume corresponds to up to that marked area, right? Not the whole. Uh, now, next is in a 250 ml conical flux, you take 25 ml standard magnesium sulfate solution, and then you add number one, 5 ml buffer solution of pH 10, right? Normally, Ferrum gas, what should be the buffer mixture or buffer solution? Whose pH will be a Sir, buffer solution is a solution that maintains pH of a solution. Yes, but which buffer solution? What is the composition of buffer that you can expect whose pH is 10? The acidic buffer solution. No, no, no. Acetic acid and sodium acetate that will have lower pH. Sir, ammonia buffer, sir? Yes, ammonium chloride and ammonium hydroxide. Right, ammonium, that is uh, basic buffer, whatever you can say. Whose pH will be around here. Okay, so that uh, buffer solution, which is a mixture of, in a proportion, suitable proportion of ammonium chloride and ammonium hydroxide. And you know how to calculate the pH of a buffer solution? What is that equation? Can you remember? Sir, pK plus log of salt by base. Uh, what is the name of that equation? Henderson equation. Yes, you're right. Yes. So, pH equal to pK plus log salt by acid. 
so that is for weak acid and it sort of strong this that is acetic acid and sodium acetate that mixture this is equation is applicable but for basic buffer that is uh, whose ph is 10 in that case the modified equation would be poh equal to pkb plus log salt by log base a uh, log salt by base concentration of salt by base now here pkb right that is minus log 10 base base ionization constant and this is generally this is the expression once you get poh then you can easily calculate poh by subtracting from 14 because at 25 degree centigrade it is true that ph plus poh would be equal to 14 right but at high temperature this is this would not be valid so only at 25 degree centigrade once you calculate poh using this henderson equation then one can find out the ph of the solution by subtracting the value of ph from 40 okay so fundamental buffer solution which is a mixture of ammonium chloride and ammonium hydroxide in suitable proportion that mixture will be supplied also in the level to ph is there it at 5 ml of that buffer solution then third point you add 2 to sorry second second point is 2 to 3 drops of solo from black tea in the cage so as you know that in acid based titration you have to take certain uh, indicator to find the end point of titration so here in this under estimation you have to take this indicator which is solo chrome black hyphen t indicator solo chrome black t you have to take two to three drops of this substance within this glass okay now after adding this black t indicator what is the what is the color of the solution within the glass the mixture will have the mixture will have wine red color right somewhat faint pink right? so if you take 25 ml standard magnesium sulfate solution and then you add 5 ml buffer solution to it and 2 to 3 drops of solochrom black tea indicator then the entire solution will turn a uh, wine red okay now this mixture you have to titrate using edta solution in the left uh, side you have shown it that you are adding something edta edta solution is run from a burette right and how to learn how long will you continue at this uh, edta solution to this conical flux actually the indicator that the end point of the titration will be indicated by the discharge of the wine red color and the appearance of sky blue color and this color change you can follow you can easily follow provided if you keep a white paper at the bottom of this flask and on the top of this mount of this flask gradually add on drop by drop this edta solution right and you can find the gradual fading of the wine red color and ultimately the whole solution will turn sky blue color so the color change from wine red to sky blue indicates that your titration is over that means whatever the amount of magnesium sulfate is present in the mixture it will be uh, it will react completely with edta solution so no more edta solution is required right so the color change you have to uh, carefully note this color change 
and that will be required to be a viva with the exam. We ask you sort of question like wine red to sky blue. So initially the solution in the conical blocks it was wine red color. Now after adding EDTA EDTA solution when the magnesium sulfate reacts completely with EDTA, you can find the solution to be sky blue, right? And this color change can be easily uh, uh, followed, provided if you use a white sheet of paper at the bottom of this conical blocks. So this is the end point of titration, and this titration you have to repeat at least times. Say in the first reading, if you get say 12.8 wood entity, and in the next it is 13.1, and in the next 12.8. So that means this wood entity that in the three stages that you obtain, that is all are consistent results because these results, these wood entity depends only by point. Two to point three units, right? So, uh, so these readings are concordant and uh, these are accepted. And suppose in the right hand side they have shown a cross sign. Suppose you get a Budet reading twelve point five. Another reading, second titration, following the same procedure, same amount of magnesium sulfate solution, you get you obtain fourteen point eight. And in the third titration, third chance, you obtain say reading 11.2. Now the question is, uh, is it reliable? All these data are reliable or not? How you justify? Because none of the data matches. At least out of three, two should be in close agreement. But you see, none of the data are in close agreement. They differ significantly by more than uh, one unit to two units, like. So that means these titrations that you uh, find that you read in the laboratory, this is not correct. And if three such readings is got like this, then again you have to carry out another fourth reading, unless you are getting at least two readings which differ at most by 0.2 uh, millimeter. Okay, at least 0 0.2 within plus minus 0.2. You know, if you if the two successive readings or any two readings are okay, then you can take it out of three. Otherwise, you can repeat five titrations. You can carry out five such titrations instead of three and check whether two or three readings are consistent or fairly close to each other. Otherwise, these sorts of reading will not be applicable. Okay, so this is very important. And you know that if you are how the division is there in the unit, you know there are the one ml, two ml, three ml, and within each uh, one milliliter range, there are ten small divisions of it, right? So that you can trace the one point one or Maximum accuracy that is 1.9, right? 1.9 milliliter. Like Sometimes you only have some uh, student report the average wooded reading in three such uh, titrations, up to three such titrations, they report like this 12.933, like this. Because in the calculator, if you take an average, sometimes this sorts of absurd expression you can find. But my question is whether this average, whatever it is obtained from your calculator, whether these are acceptable or not. One second, no. Because maximum accuracy that you can produce in a is 0.1 mm, not more than that. So whenever you are producing, we are reporting a bullet reading and it is coming out the figure it is 9.93 that means what is the accuracy of the first point this will place it is 0 0.03 but the maximum accuracy or the uh, that you can produce in a reading is 0.1 mm because there is only 10 small division 
So maximum accuracy to be 0.1 mm, not see 0.03, not more than 0.1. Okay, so that's why whenever you are taking this three bullet reading and take the average, this is right that all the three readings are consistent. But if it, when you take the average, it comes this figure. The figure is coming out like this. But don't report it in this form. Rather, you approximate it in the first place of this number. That is 12.9. Because the bullet reading, the maximum accuracy that you can report is not more than 0.1 mm. Okay. So you have to always bullet uh, reading, whether it is average reading, uh, it should be always round it up up to first place of decimal. Okay, instead of 12.568, whatever it is, uh, it can be noted from your calculator, but it's, when it should be reported as a bullet reading, you must convert it, you must take the data up to first place of decimal. There is rounding up of up to first place of this Okay, so up to this, do you have any confusion or any clarification you need? Please. Sir, can you please repeat that the reading part that you said that some set of values is not allowed? Sometimes, suppose you are getting 12.8, 13.1 to 12.9. There is no more, no two readings divided by more than 0.1 or 0.2. So that means these readings are reliable or consistent. And you can take the average. Now once you take average, the calculator, the value is coming out to be 12.9, like that. <coughs> but the question is, scientifically, how will you report a bullet reading? You must report up to the first place of the value, right? Not more than that. Why? <coughs> Because the small graduation in the bullet reading should be point one, That's not more than that. <coughs> okay. So this is very important. Okay. Are you very confused? Understood, sir. Okay. Now, second point is titration of the supplied hard water sample. Now, instead of magnesium sulfate solution, which is standard solution, that means a solution of known state that is supplied to you in order to standardize, means to find the exact strength of the supply DTA solution. Now we have to carry out another phase of titration, that is titration of the supplied hard water sample. That you can collect from any source, and that uh, hard water sample you can take from the tap water or like that. Whatever. And follow the same procedure, procedure itself. That means instead of 25 ml. Uh, magnesium sulfate solution, now you take 25 ml water sample, that is hard water sample. And there you add ammonia solution, drop by drop, and sec the mixture. Right. Till the solution in the plus smells of ammonia. Right. Actually, uh, this may happen because suppose you have a magnesium sulfate solution. You know magnesium sulfate in the aqueous medium, it undergoes hydrolysis to produce magnesium hydroxide and acid. Not only magnesium sulfate, any uh, soluble sorts of magnesium, say magnesium chloride, like that, also undergo this sorts of hydrolysis. So, to avoid this uh, uh, hydrolysis, right, 
So what we have to do to avoid this or to check or to prevent this uh, hydrolysis, that means if we have excess yeast to support solution, uh, generally ammonia solution is added drop by drop, right, till the solution in the slugs smell of ammonia. So you take these uh, solutions, that is 25 ml hard water sample, then uh, ammonia solution drop by drop, set the mixture, till the solution of the plant will stop ammonia. Right, there is no more acidity in the acid present in the plants. So after that, you add high level buffer solution. Of each day as before, and two to three drops of solochrome black tea. Just like previous citations, you have to add high ml buffer solution instead of two to three drops. Now you have to add high ml buffer solution of sorry, there also it was five ml. Uh, okay, five ml, right? This five ml buffer solution. You have to add and then two to three drops of syrup from that and follow the same procedure. So in the titration of hard water sample, uh, you have to take hard water sample 25 ml. Then number one, you have to add ammonia solution till there is no smells of uh, still the person ammonia smells of till the solution in the plant smells of ammonia, right? That is, uh, unless the uh, smell of ammonia evolves, you continue adding uh, ammonia solution and sick. And after that, you add high ml buffer solution of pH 10 and 2 to 3 drops of siloprom that Now, the rest of the procedure of this titration is similar to that as standardization process. Described above. So that I'm not repeating. The rest procedure of this citation is similar to that as standardization process. Now the question is that you know that hardness of the water sample is generally expressed in ppm unit, that is parts per million. And how to report it? The calculation should be in the As I already discussed, that uh, W, like W is the gram of, say, magnesium salt or calcium salt or iron salt is present in 20 pyramid sample. Right? W. Then, uh, then you have to find out PPM. Always you have to convert it in the amount of equivalent amount of my calcium carbonate. Right. So X gram, suppose calcium carbonate, X gram, not X gram equivalent. So you have to calculate first what is the gram equivalent of calcium carbonate where W gram salts are present, whether it is magnesium, calcium, or iron salts, or all the three salts are present, that is total weight to W gram in the 25 ml hard water sample. And this W gram salt is equivalent to how much calcium carbonate? Say X gram calcium. Right. Then, uh, what is the gram equivalent of calcium carbonate? So that, say whatever the value, multiply that gram equivalent of calcium carbonate, which is nothing but formula weight by 2. The either cation or an analysis. So, PPM means ultimately you have to find out, you have to calculate like this. There is X gram calcium carbonate 
give it by 10 to the power 6 grams. Right. So this is the calculation. How to report PPA? So from the titrations, from the titrations, we have to find out what is the equivalent amount of what is the equivalent amount of calcium carbonate is present. And if you know that amount, then multiply it with equivalent weight of calcium carbonate. And you know how to calculate equivalent weight of calcium carbonate. That is molar mass divided by 2. Okay. So in this way, we have to express it in PPM level. That is 10 to the power 8 grams. Suppose calcium carbonate is present in 10 to the power 6 grams water salt. Okay. So this is the experimental uh, procedure regarding this uh, estimation of hardness of water sample. And meanwhile, if you come to the institute, then in the laboratory we can set up, we can demonstrate both these experiments. Okay, or you can do yourself, at least you can uh, do that. Okay. Okay. Now, yes, sir. Now we discuss a little about the conductance. In the last class, I have uh, made a comment that uh, you know also that why H plus ion and which minus ion they have exceptionally large or high value of conductance. Why? Why the conductance of H plus or H minus ion are uh, exceptionally high? That was the question. Why extraordinarily large? How we can explain that? Actually, H plus ion and H minus ions, these ions do not move across the solution like other cations and anions. This is the distinctive feature between the passage of these ions or movement of these ions with respect to other cations and ions. That is, H plus ions and H minus ion, they do not propagate through the solution like other ions from one end to other ends. Right? That I mentioned here. These ions do not move across the solution like other cations and anions. Then what is the way how these cations H plus and moves from one end to other end? See, suppose there are two electrodes, one is marked as plus, another is marked as negative. Negative electrode we call no cathode and positive electrode we call anode. When the cell is an electrolytic cell, electrolytic cell, then the sign means anode has a plus sign and cathode that electrode has a negative sign. Now you know that H plus ion it can form say uh, hydrogen bond, right? It is dividing say one water molecule. And in the first uh, in the first uh, you see uh, H3O formation of H3O plus. That means one proton, it uh, say lone pair of electron uh, and this proton, a coordinate type of bond. But ultimately, you know, this coordinate bond is very difficult to distinguish from normal covalent bond. That means in H3O plus, actually, all which bonds are the same, are equivalent. Anyway, so first H3O plus, it's structure is shown here and due to the uh, hydrogen bonding effect you know 
the water molecules the next uh, neighboring uh, water molecule would be like this because oxygen has a negative polarity uh, whereas hydrogen has positive polarity means partly positive charge so due to electrostatic or coulomb attraction the orientation the favorable orientation would be like this now naturally for the next water molecule in the close proximity the other uh, water molecule what should be its orientation it would be orienting in like this because of the polarity of these so basically suppose we have considered three water molecules in the chain right in between two molecules that is cathode and anode this is the first step. second step what happens these as i've shown in the arrow that is this h plus now passes to the next molecule right and the first h plus plus molecule itself turns like this into water molecule but once again this polarity direction of the polarity will remain intact that is o minus and the h plus they are directed like this they are attracting so this h plus passes to the next or the second water molecule and the picture will be like this so is the u plus it will be is the u plus second molecule now in the third phase what happens this proton again migrates to the neighboring water molecule and ultimately it forms h3 o plus so interestingly you see this movement that is a proton that is in the form of hydronium ion moves uh, from anode to cathode electron right through this uh, migration and uh, now look one thing is that uh, to get uh, another water another proton to be transmitted following the same uh, procedure the suitable orientation of the water molecule is required right so again these water molecules will orient in such a way that again they capture eight plus ions uh, in the chain uh, at the beginning of the chain and ultimately it gradually be liberated at the other end of the chain that is eight plus and basically uh, move across these water molecules through hydrogen bonding uh, the sequence right so this is the mechanism that sometimes called rothas uh, mechanism of proton jump mechanism proton jump mechanism. and how which minus and moves that is shown here this is first phase for proton and in the second case how which minus propagates or moves across the solution is given it here right you just follow how it works because which ion will move from cathode to anode electron and that that is so much so basically in all these when i did the h plus movement of h plus ion or to h minus ion mechanism is popularly called proton jump mechanism there is migration of proton uh, in the neighboring uh, water molecule and this migration will be supported or enhanced due to the uh, hydrogen bonding ability of inherent uh, quality of the proton right molecule so this is the basic that is how h plus and, and how h minus are Okay. So that part we have discussed. Now, in the last part, in the last discussion, uh, I think. Uh, Most of the electrochemists, I think, are familiar with your uh, term as 
particular and see so you know this is uh, I'll discuss only important concepts most of you are familiar with this okay what is kolas law you know what is that what is kolas law suppose if you subtract the limiting equivalent conductance or conductance of infinite uh, dilution equivalent conductance of infinite dilution of say, two salts like kcl and nacl then that difference must be equal to the limiting value that is lambda zero of kno3 and nno3 whether it is a uh, chloride salt or say nitrate salt but the difference would be equal exactly right there is basically it is equivalent to lambda zero k plus minus lambda zero na plus now how we can justify this this is possible you know as in if we split this uh, equivalent conductance of say potassium salt which is contributed due to with same uh, weight factor that is lambda uh, zero k plus plus lambda zero c minus and here also in the substitute right so can we write like this so that's why this part that is second part that is contribution due to chloride ion cancels out and we are left with the difference of the uh, conducting ability difference of the conducting ability of the corresponding cations that is lambda 0 k plus minus lambda 0 n plus okay now sometimes in some books uh, since it is written like that so i have also follow same uh, notation that is lc0 la0 lc0 means for cation uh, conductance right and anionic conductance is given by la0 but actually uh, lambda 0 of the uh, equivalent not equivalent uh if you know the lambda 0 value of the salt then of course it depends whether it is a uh a salt like this or the other so one can write uh, important quantity that you call mobility of an ion what is mobility of an ion mobility of an ion is its velocity under unit potential this is very important this quantity that is mobility sometimes b class is written that it denotes plus sign mobility of cation now the mobility of a cation that is lambda 0 c right that can be expressed like this p1 plus we go to the text for this p quantity this is for this equation so lambda 0 c cation that is equal to k constant p1 n plus z plus p p plus what is n plus and in minor n plus is equal to n plus or n Say for example, we have a uh, salt like this, denoted by n n plus z plus. Z plus is the electron, and n plus is the number in the stoichiometric number. Right? So maybe number it is maybe one two three four. Okay. Okay. So n n plus z plus n n minus z minus. When we start Split in aqueous medium, it will split like this. That is new plus m z plus p and plus new minus m z. Plus. 
So it electro neutrality of the lipolytic cell, it electro neutrality, right? We can say it all like this. Uh, suppose you have for this particular salt, when it ionizes in the form of new plus, new plus and new minus of the stoichiometric coefficients of this. Now, Z plus E is the total charge of the M ion and A Z minus E is the total negative charge of A. Okay. And from electro neutrality consideration of the electro cell, can we write this? Nu plus Z plus E must, mod, must be equal to this algebraic magnitude of these three quantities. That is mu plus z plus e must be equal to mu minus z minus. Can you write it? This is the condition of electronutility. Means in aqua solution, you have no extra current. Okay. And so lambda is really equal to like this. You can write and. These are the different expressions of nu plus, nu minus. What are these quantities? Can you guess? Nu plus is the mobility of cation and nu minus is the mobility of the Now, T plus is zero. What is that? Transport number. Right. Transport number of the cation is given by lambda zero. That is equivalent conductance. Limiting to L conductance due to cation by lambda zero total conductance. Okay. So T plus transport number of cation is defined like this, and you get ultimately this expression is very important. That is T plus equal to new a V plus by V plus plus V minus. Uh, v minus and V plus are the respective velocity, mobility or the velocity of the ions in the solution. Likewise, T minus zero, superscript zero, you know, that is the limiting value of the highest. All these things are you can find in this is okay text here. Otherwise, if you can follow my picture, then you have no Okay, do you have any question? Hello? Hello? No, Okay, suppose sometimes from the graphical presentations you see, uh, you cannot calculate lambda zero of acidic acid because uh, if you follow, if you see the train that is like this. For HCl and KCl, you can easily extrapolate it and get the limiting value of the equivalent conductance that is lambda zero equivalent, right? That is limiting value of and concentration tends to zero. But the question is for acetic acid, since the pattern of the curve is somewhat different, as you know, acetic acid is the train is like that. So you cannot extrapolate it to get the lambda zero value, right? For acetic acid. Or any weak acid or weak solvent. But the question is how we can get it, say for acetic acid, for example. How to find out the limiting value of equivalent conductance or molar conductance of acetic acid? Right. So for that, we have to take three strong elements, sodium nitrogen and sodium. Whose lambda is zero value are known. Or you can estimate from the graph, you can extrapolate. All these three are 
ACL, sodium acetate, sodium chloride, all these are strong electrolytes. So by graphical means, you can calculate that much. Okay. And next, you again apply Kullas. So you see, lambda is given as is equal to lambda is given as equal to sodium acetate plus lambda zero is C. And you are subtracting from it the lambda zero value of NAC. So ultimately, this is this. So what is the value for better? Read the definition. It is the field of ions under unit potential rate. Right. That is one part centimeter in the And these are the relations that we already discussed and follow that. And meanwhile, if you have any doubts, all these things you can find it, uh, is it okay? I am living, uh, all these things are there. But in PC, okay, the symbols that, you, that I used here, they also are already there. Okay. It's a book of So this is the procedure. Okay. Then suppose you have total current strength. How to calculate? C by 10 to the power 3, V plus plus V minus, if F is the current area. That is 1 gram equivalent electrolyte carries 1 Faraday of electricity. 1 Faraday is equal to 96520 Coulomb. That is 96520 Coulomb. Okay. And lambda 0 for cation, that is equivalent limiting value of the equivalent conductance due to cation is given by this expression mu plus z plus v plus f and similar expression for the contribution that is equivalent limiting value of the equivalent conductance due to cation is given by mu minus z minus v minus f. You see, okay, do it. So, all these expressions you can find in the
I suggest you to go through these topics and have a practice for numerical problems. So these expressions is very important. Transport number and mobility related problems. Suppose in a solution, if you have several cations and anions, then the transport number of all the ions, sum of the transport number of all ions must be equal to unity. Because transport number is a fractional current carried by an ion. Suppose if in a solution there are several ions of different kinds, right, in different concentrations, then naturally the fraction of the current carried by different ions. But their total sum must be equal to you. It must be equal. Okay. Now another unique question that you are also familiar. Suppose if you are asked what should be the order of crystallographic radii if you have to arrange the cations, alkali metal ions, like this, lithium, sodium ions, potassium ions, rubidium and cesium ions. Right? As you know, if you move from uh, top to bottom, uh, down to this periodic table in a group. If you move from right elements to heavier one, then what would happen? The new principal quantum number and gradually adds on, and the, the size of the ions also increases. Right? So if you arrange the crystallographic radius, so it would be like this. The radii plus, it, it is less than sodium plus, radius of the sodium plus. Right? And so on. But the question is, in aqueous solution of the salts or the ions, which ion will have a larger contribution to the conductance? Can you guess? In the screen, which ion carries the least conductance? Hello. Hello. Sir, lithium plus. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Which ion will uh, will have a uh, greater contribution to electricity? Or which ion will move faster? Light plus or cesium plus? You see, lithium is more, so mobility should be more. Yes, actually, you see Li plus and compare with K plus, sodium, a potassium plus. You see, lithium, of course, from respect to lithium, size of the potassium ion is larger, but both possess unique positive charge. So, charge density will be larger, considerably larger in the case of lithium atom because of its small sphere, where one unique positive charge density is distributed. Right? So naturally, this lithium ion will be more strongly solvated, means the oxygen uh, end of the water molecules will surround this lithium ion at a greater extent due to greater electrostatic force of it. Whereas, <laughs> much less water molecule will surround the potassium ion. Because positive charge density on the sphere, potassium sphere, is small. And so electrostatic force of attraction between the polar water molecule and this positively charged molecules will be less. So that means hydrated lithium ion will be larger in size compared to hydrated potassium ion. Although with crystallographic radius, in the ionic crystal, potassium ion has a larger size compared to lithium ion, but in the aqua space, the reverse is true. That is, hydrated or solvated lithium ion is larger in size compared to potassium ion. As a result of that, as the ions are bulkier, then naturally the speed of the ions across the solution will gradually. And so in aqueous medium, you see, 
ionic conductances will be least for sodium ion, less for lithium ion, but it is highest with cesium ion. So this is the train, the reverse of the crystalline capital. Right. So mobility also actually mobility of cesium plus ion will be highest, but the corresponding molar condition, the ionic conductance will also increase in the same order. That is lithium to sodium to potassium to increase. Because hydrated uh, lithium ions will be larger in size and also heavier. That's why its mobility is less least as well as its equivalent uh, conductance. It will also be used. So this is the part that uh, we should know, and I think you are familiar with these topics also. Yeah. Now, the biochemical theory of interionic attractions, you know, that I will discuss and three important effects of the electrophoretic effect and PN effect. And another effect is called Debye Falcon Hagen effect. Okay, so that uh, we will not consider. We will discuss only these two important terms that is, electrophoretic effect and uh, what is that? Electrophoretic effect. Another is relaxation. That we discuss. Present. In the developmental theory of internal attraction, so what is the basic assumption or the theoretical model that we can apply? That is, suppose uh, a cation is a plus, it will be in aqueous medium. So what happens? The negatively charged, negatively charged ions will surround this positive ion and vice versa. So that means the negatively charged ions will be uh, surrounded by in a spherically symmetric form by oppositely charged ions, that is cations. Right. Now my question is what happens? Suppose symmetrical, suppose in a sphere, in the center of the sphere there is a cation, a positive a positive charge. And the negative charge density will be uh, on the surface of the sphere would be such that would be such that the total charge density, if you sum it, integrate it, the charge density on the surface of the sphere, it would be exactly equal to our unit. Right? So as if a neutral unity. If we disregard or do not contribute or do not consider the diffuse field limit, arms at far larger distances, if we, right? Actually, uh, you can think of the several uh, radius, spherical radius, where charge density, negative charge density gradually falls out. But the question is how what, what should be the limiting value of this there? So there is different aspects that I'm not considering, but for simplicity, I'm discussing like that. Suppose you have a positive ion at the center of the sphere, and the sphere encompasses negative charges. Right. And the centroid of the positive and negative charge J on the sphere will coincide. That is shown in the left side. Plus and minus charges, they uh, denote the coincide means they are on the same point. So the centroid of positive charge would be at the center itself. And the negative charge density on the distributed over the sphere, that will also have a centroid at the, the centroid of negative charge density will also be at the same point, that is at the center of the sphere. So that means positive and negative charges as it coincide at the same point. So that means there is no charge separation of the polarity. When the ion is at rest, then the spherical symmetry is maintained. That is, the cation is perfectly surrounded by 
oppositely charged ions to the spherical elliptic form, and there will be no net polarity between the cation and anion. Right. Similar is the case for say anion when anion is here at the center and positive charge is inside. So when are when ions are at rest, the perfect symmetry, this perfect spherical symmetry of ion atmosphere is right. When the ions are at rest, means when the ions are being ions moving, even thermal vegetation is very Again, then only the spherical structure uh, will remain intact and uh, there will be no charge separations. So, that I have mentioned here when ions are at rest, the perfect spherical symmetry of ion atmosphere is. Now, this is the case positive and negative charge and dry, they coincide when the ions are at rest. Now, this is the case when, say, the spherical symmetry is lost because when you apply an external electric field, so what happens? The central cation would have a tendency to move towards the cathode, whereas the surrounding negative charges will have a tendency to move towards the anode. Right? The negative charges will move towards the anode, whereas central cation moves towards the cathode. And because of this opposing motion of the ions, the spherical symmetry of the ion atmosphere will be lost. Right. And because of this distorted structure that we call uh, in the right side in the blue ink I have found that is uh, now if, what is the centroid of this negative charge? It would be somewhat like this. Right, just behind that of the centroid of the positive charge. So, in this situation, when the ion atmosphere is in the distorted form, the two charge centroids, that is due to positive charge and negative charges, the two opposite charge centroids, they will not coincide. Rather, they would have a different center, or we can say, a polarity because the opposite charges they are separated by certain distance we call the polarity right a polarity is developed like this and as a result of that what happens what happens this uh, plus charge that is positive charge will fill a dragging force because electrostatic force of attraction the central ion will be pulled by the dragging net negative charge centroid, right? As a result of that, as a result of that, the speed of the central ion, the risk cation will be reduced or retarded, right? So this effect we call asymmetric effect or relaxation effect, which inverts the speed of the central ion, like this. Okay. Now at this stage, if you have any uh, question or any clarification, you can raise any, any question, right? That is how the loss or distortion of the spherical symmetry regards charge separation due to the charge separation means here yeah, the polarity uh, or the center of the charges will no more coincide. Rather, they will have a distance, they will be apart by some distance. And because of this polarity, right, there is accumulation of greater negative charge at the opposite of the direction of the motion of the cation. We call this a dragon force that is central and we now have a retarding attractive pull of force of attraction, right, due to its negative charges, which are now more spherical symmetry. So this is called asymmetric effect or relaxation. The same place happens to the negative ions. So a cation moves towards cathode, 
but due to the greater accumulation of negative charge behind to this cation due to this distorted uh, atmosphere so this cation will be done by done by uh, will be retarded by the negative charge that is behind it right and as a result of the speed of the ion so the mobility of the ion or the ion conductance itself is lower or decreased and this effect we call it accession effect now there is another interesting effect we call electrophoretic effect what is that electrophoretic effect this is very interesting as you know all the ions in the ion atmosphere central ion itself hydrated or aqueous corresponding negative charges surrounding this positive ion they are also hydrated this is interesting now suppose if external electric field is applied then what will happen the central cation along with its hydrated molecules water molecules will move towards the cathode likewise the anions which are shown is there that means anions along with their solvated water molecules or surrounding water molecules will move towards the anode and so this is the case now no what is vs vs is velocity of solvent molecule opposite to the opposite to the motion of the center actually here we are interested to find the relative velocity right what is v plus another is g plus i v plus v plus v plus what is v plus prime v plus prime is the actual velocity of the Cation, right? Actual velocity. And what is the relative velocity? So the cation is moving with the speed, speed v f prime, whereas v plus prime, sorry, and the velocity of the solvent molecules opposite to opposite opposite to the motion of this cation will be this. Now the question is why? Because there is plenty of uh, Surrounding negative charges, so with, along with their solvated water molecule moves in the towards the anode. Then naturally, uh, the there will be a steaming motion that is uh, um, cations and its water molecules moving in this direction. Another surrounding water molecules in close contact they are moving in opposite direction, so that the central cation will have a relative velocity v plus, which is So we can label like this: relative velocity of the central cation with respect to the solvent molecules surrounding it, like say V plus. And by definition of the relative velocity, you know V plus must be equal to V plus plus V s because V plus and V my V s they are all in opposite direction. So the relative velocities will be just sum of these two quantities. Okay, so this is very important. Relative velocity. How we can define the relative velocity of the solvent cation with respect to static solvent? Okay. Now you know Stokes' law is there. That is a frictional force. That is when the ions moves across the medium. There is a frictional force that is given by. Minus six by eta r plus a plus, where eta this quantity we call the viscosity coefficient of the solvent, and r plus is the radius of the cation, and v plus is the relative velocity. Hence, the central cation will experience a greater frictional force, which in turn towards the velocity of the Hence, the central cation will experience a greater frictional force, which in turn 
towards the velocity of the thing. Right. Now, the magnitude of heat plus would be less provided the solvent molecules should have no or the solvent molecules at this ideal will be static. If solvent molecules should not move at all, only the isolated cations and anions are moving, then the contribution of this EF will be quite easy. Right. But since solvent molecules surrounding the positive charges moves in opposite direction because number of negative charges in a sphere, ion atmosphere is much larger compared to the central cation. So if all the solvated ions and ions they are moving in the opposite direction. So solvent molecules will exactly uh, as if all the solvent as if the solvent molecules will move towards the opposite direction to the motion of the cation. And this returns the speed of the cation. Right. And it is given by so the plus would be relative velocity would be larger. That would be equal to V plus pi plus two. Okay. And as for Stokes law, the traditional distance by length. And I'm not going to discuss in detail, but in empirical cold law law. <coughs> So this is the exact derivation, that expression that we can find derived based on the theoretical consideration of the regime tiny vector is the biological thing, whatever it is. So lambda is the equivalent contact times at any concentration, which is equal to lambda zero. That is equivalent contact times when concentration is tends to zero. There is limiting value of the equivalent conductance minus there is a sum of two terms. In the first term, you see at 2.4 by dt raised to the power half theta plus 8.2 into 10 to the power minus 5 by dt raised to the power 3. What is d? And dt is the temperature in Kelvin. And it is the viscosity coefficient as you want to discuss. So, D is the dielectric constant. So, okay. so, this is the expression. And since for a given solvent and at a given temperature, all these quantities are constants. So, we can write in compact quantity A plus B lambda is. So this is the <clears throat> So the first term and the second term, which one is the electrophoretic effect? The first one is the electrophoretic effect term, and second one is the term due to relaxation. Today will not discuss anymore. So these are the two terms. One is the energy is with the electrophoretic effect, another is with the electrical effect. Right. So each term appears, you can remember. So the first term corresponds to the electrophoretic effect, and the second one is electrical. Okay, that's all. Hello. Sir, this proof will be asked in the exam. No, no, no. No proof. Only you have to justify. You have to write down these explanations. What is the first term? 
because it is related to the it is the dispositive position so you can remember that the first term in the parenthesis appears from the uh, configuration of electro phonetic effect and the second term arises from the relaxation effect or acidity so in compact notation you can write lambda equal to lambda 0 minus within the parenthesis a plus b lambda 0 square plus b. A is given by this expression, b is given by this expression. At a given temperature and also dielectric constant b and b is always a constant. So you can put it in this thing. Okay. So there will be numericals on these equations. Uh, no numericals, you not get, but numericals probably we can expect from this part. That is transport number, mobility, like this, from this way. But I think we will be able to uh, answer all these things. Okay. So you go through this and discuss it. Okay. So, do you know when you when will be your uh, exam? Do you have any idea? Sir, from 18 April. 18 April. Okay. So I think before that will be finished, and I will give you some suggestions. Okay. But uh, that your exam will be on offline mode. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, how many of you are staying now in the campus? Have you got any accommodation? Sir, they told us from 6th. From 6th April? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, those who are staying nearby campus, no problem, but those who are uh, coming from outside state, uh, then they'll have to no other choice but to stay in the campus. How about the campus is very nice, no problem. I think you can enjoy the campus. Okay. Okay, don't be worried. I will give you concrete suggestions so that uh, you'll have no problem. I think uh, you'll do better in the exam, no problem. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. So today I'll not discuss anymore. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you, sir. you sir. Thank you all.